when I was a little kid. I used to be a farmer. Mm -hmm. I was in Future Farmers of America, obviously, <coughs> in school. 4-H, have you heard of 4-H? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Go to the county fairs, you'll see these groups. And so that's what I thought I was going to do. Well, then I loved music. I still love music. And so I thought, well, I love singing. And so I uh, went to college, Northwest Missouri State University, and I became a music major. And then I became uh, a music teacher. So I started teaching music in Griswold, Iowa, for five years. And that was just about 20 miles from where I grew up. And then I thought, well, then I had these aspirations to become a college uh, music professor, so I, that means I have to get a master's degree. So off I went uh, to the University of Missouri, Kansas City. My wife and I would go down there in the summertime, and we would go to school. And so then I got my master's in choral conducting, and I moved to Springfield, Missouri. I taught in a high school, big high school down there. And then got kind of got my attention. I was able to have two by four <laughs> <laughs> on the side of my head. Um, and uh, long story short, I just I had this principal that really didn't like me, and I thought I'm so likable. I shouldn't. Why am I having this struggle? And this, this guy kind of had a type A personality and whatnot. I was there for three years, and finally he said, you know, I'm not going to be able to renew you for tenure and because I was up for tenure. I just finished my master's degree, so I was going to bump up on the scale. Scale. I can't talk today. Get a pay scale. <laughs> That's funny when the words come out from the opposite of the pay scale. And so, anyway, uh, at during that time, I started praying, and I was involved in a Lutheran church and a Presbyterian church. I directed a Presbyterian church choir. And so um, I prayed about it, and instead of feeling like sorry for myself that's going through this turmoil, my wife said, Well, you know, when we got married, the pastor said that I would make a that she would make a really good pastor's wife. And we thought <laughs> that was so funny. <laughs> Eight years later, um, then that kind of came back and I was getting lots of joy in serving in church. I was like a, a choir director, I was involved in the in the Lutheran church there in Springfield. And then um, it was one of those things about wonder. You know, you ever wonder if God's trying to get your attention? Anybody ever had a moment like that in your life where that's happened? And so I started praying about it. And pretty soon, uh, lo and behold, um, my wife said, you know, what if he's trying to get your attention to be going into ministry? And so we prayed about that. Well, we have seven houses for sale within about, you know, two or, four, two or three blocks from our house. And it's in Springfield, Missouri, where there's a, every fourth house is a repeat, you know. And I thought, ah, there's no way. I'm going to put that fleece out there, and uh, pretty soon it'll just go away, and we won't think about this anymore. Well, we put our house for sale. We went to Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota, and applied for uh, to go to school there to see if I was going to, you know, get in. And so when I went, I wrote this entrance exam on the way, and then they read it, and they interviewed us, and said, we think you need to come to seminary. So that was part of the fleece. Then the next part of the fleece was if our house would sell. You know, that's, that's just very unlikely. And so, anyway, we got a phone call while we are at the seminary, just checking it out. And they said, well, we have a buyer for your house, and you can get, you're getting what you asked for it, and you can live there until the end of the school year. And so we were just like blown away by that. Well, that was then on the seminary we went, long story short, seminary, and then I did my internship at a church that your parents went to. Your parents are both home with the Lord now. But I was just there just a couple of weeks ago. I hadn't been there for years. Just walked through those halls of Trinity Lutheran Church of Mini Hong Kong Falls. What you gave me a love for missions work. And um, I was there for four years. I directed the church choir there and um, did my internship. They, don't, they had, didn't have an internship before I came, and I haven't had an internship since then. <laughs> so I don't know what that says about me. 
But they, they, while I was there, they allowed me to do my internship, which is kind of a big thing in the Lutheran Church, because it's, it's a lot. And so it's four years of seminary, and then off I was wondering where I'm going to go next. And I thought I was going to stay there in Minneapolis. I thought maybe I'd get to serve that church that did my internship. I love the people there. And then God kind of closed that door, and then I had the door opened up here at this church. And so that was 20 years ago, and uh, I would never have thought I'd been here that long. I think they can, they just don't know how to get rid of me. <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, I've been here for 20 years, going on 21 years. And uh, so anyway, uh, my wife Marcia and I have two kids, we have Emily and Jonathan. Uh, Emily has a son, Thomas, I'm a grandpa. And uh, Jonathan still lives at home, and uh, he, he's a truck driver for Pepsi over in the Soviet Union. And so uh, we're thankful that he was doing over the road trucking, and that was kind of scary knowing he was going to be you know, out there all the time. So I just want to share that as a precursor to my faith uh, growing up in a Lutheran family was steeped in God's Word. Okay? Every morning, uh, my parents would, in this on this farm that I grew up on, we would um, we'd have breakfast together. My parents would have breakfast first, and I would hear them go downstairs, and, and my mom would fix breakfast, and they would talk about things. You could hear it through the floors of the house. <laughs> and uh, anyway, um, uh, my parents we'd have this rich. Farm breakfast, you know, high cholesterol, eggs, <laughs> and, 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 and then uh, they would read to me our, our daily bread. You've all heard of our daily bread, yes. our <laughs> devotional bread. Uh, anyway, we, we still pass those out here at our church. If you ever need some, we always have enough in our narthex, and you can just take whatever you need. And uh, anyway, uh, they would read that to us. And so, uh, besides that, my parents really, I mean, I love my parents, but they had a serious problem. They had a drug problem. And I know it's hard to understand back in Iowa, but they drug me to church. They drug me to, <laughs> they drug me to everything at church. So my parents both taught Sunday school, and we had two hours of chores to do every morning before we went to church. Sunday school started at 9.15, and we'd have to be out the door by 9.05, because it's about 10 minutes drive to, to the church. And oh my goodness, that's just my, that was my routine. And so I'm thankful for my roots, thankful for my parents' drug problem, because <laughs> I wouldn't be here today uh, be without that. And so um, as we celebrate the Reformation today, the Reformation has, as you probably know, has affected all of us, right? I'm not a Luther scholar by any means, but I'm just going to try to give you some nuggets along the way today about the Reformation. I mean, I, I'm still learning about all this, and uh, from what happened was Matthew 4.17, this is not in its bulletin at all, but I'm just going to give you this scenario to kind of get it started. But Matthew 4.17 is, uh, and I didn't look it up, and I don't have my glasses. But, uh, anybody got it real quick or on the phone or something? Okay. Just, just read that for me. Just. Okay, this is, uh, from that time Jesus began to preach and say, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, <laughs> repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the part we want to, we're actually going to talk about repent, okay? Repent in the Greek is a word metanoia or metanoia, it's repent, okay? But in the early days, back in uh, way, way back before even Luther, there was Jerome. And Jerome uh, translated the Bible into what is called the Latin Vulgate, okay? And so in the Latin Vulgate, um, when he translated that word, he called, he, instead of repentance, he made it do penance, okay? Which is completely kind of different. And so, as church history kind of moved along, 
Well, in the Catholic Church, of the Roman, Holy Roman Catholic Church, they started doing all of these things that are not from the Bible. Do penance instead of repentance. You see where I'm going? It's just totally mixed it up. Luther didn't know that until he was studying to be, uh, he, what, he got called to be a monk. Now, he had a, a, a two by four over the top of his head, too, but it was more a lightning bolt strike. Uh, maybe you've heard the story that uh, he was going through the forest and a storm came up and it, a fierce thunderstorm. Any of you have ever been back in the Midwest when there's a fierce thunderstorm? I have, and I can tell you, you don't want to be outside when it's doing that because you're gonna, you, you're a lightning rod. People get struck by lightning and killed very easily because you're taller and it, the electricity is drawn right to the highest point. When I was a kid, I'll tell you a little farm story, and I tell lots of farm stories in my sermons. But when I was growing up, um, we milked cows, we had pigs and everything on the farm, and I just hated the smell of the cows when they got rained on. I had, oh, it's so bad over <laughs> And so I just wanted to get the cows in the barn before this thunderstorm was coming up. So I took off on our horse, Frisky, to go get the cows in the barn. And as I was going, I realized, um, I think I'm making a mistake here because, you know, this big black cloud is coming up. And so I just remember my dad, he saw me going, well, Frisky was so bound determined to get the cows in because that's all Frisky knows to do, right? He's a horse that is used to crowd cattle. And so he, was, he knew what we were doing. I mean, he was an autopilot. And so I was hanging on for dear life, and this, this thunderstorm came up really hard and fast. Lightning, thunder, hail. I mean, the hail was coming down, and I couldn't, I couldn't steer Frisky back to the barn to get out of this hailstorm and rain. And anyway, um, it just, the cows were running, their udders were running, milk was flying out of the udder. <laughs> milk and just wet, you know, when I got back from my dad was so upset with me. Well, that kind of an experience was happening to Luther when he was in this thunderstorm, and so he prayed to God that if you spare my life, I will become a monk, and I'll follow you forever. And be careful what you tell God you're going to do. <laughs> and so he did, and he stuck to his work. And Luther was just enamored with trying to understand how to please God, how to do penance. I'm coming back to this Bible passage now, because that's what he thought it meant, that, that it was purgatory. There was all these things that had come about over many years leading up to the Reformation. The early church fathers were sinners like you and I, and they wanted to do things to take care of themselves and to get money to come in, so they got creative with this. And there was indulgences, and people would pay money so that the sins could be forgiven. Again, I'm getting really general concepts here today, but there's a whole lot to this. And Jerome made a mistake when he was translating that, and it's been kind of brought forward now over years. And even the Catholic Church, I was just reading online to see when it was, probably wasn't that many years ago, that they just finally, in these newer translations, are getting it back to the Latin, excuse me, to the Greek, the original uh, language of the Bible and Hebrew. And so um, the Catholic Church had gone down this wrong path. So Luther saw this when he was studying God's Word. God revealed it to him. And so it changed, helped change it back. Now, for Reformation, I don't know if you know this or not, but red is the liturgical church color for Reformation. Uh, there's another uh, special day of the year that I know you celebrate too, that we would wear red. Anybody know what that is? Valentine's. Well, Valentine's. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, it's Pentecost. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Pentecost, the day of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Pentecost and Valentine's Day might go together. <laughs> but the, the, the fire of the Holy Spirit coming down with tongues of fire 
on the people because the Holy Spirit was being given to them. And so the color for Reformation has become traditional over the years. We still have some traditions in the Lutheran Church that we carry out. But that red is the color for that because of the fire of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that actually, uh, we believe, you know, helped Luther to understand, to look in the scripture deeply, go to the original languages, discern, decipher each of those words in the context of its meaning so that he could get to the truth of God's word. And so, as I'm gonna to explain to you in this, minute, in this PowerPoint, that uh, we have this wonderful tradition. Are we able to hear the, the little video, do you think? Uh, yeah. Oh, we do? Oh, that's great. I didn't think we'd be able to, so I was trying to yeah. figure out how I was going to do this. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I have the blessing of having uh, three other uh, pastors. We have actually four other pastors that help with uh, lots of stuff in our church. And so I thought it would be a good idea to get them together to talk about what we're going to do special for this day. 500th anniversary doesn't come around very often. And so we thought, hmm, what are we going to do? So then we had a little fun here. So I'll be like to do it. Of the Reformation, yes. he and the Holy Spirit got to make it just fantastic. A great, I think something really dramatic, really cool. Okay. And I think if we all dressed up in costumes and we reenact the Reformation, I think it'd be awesome. And I could go across the street to St. Nicholas Catholic Church and nail the 95 pieces on the door of <laughs> Yeah. In Los Angeles a few weeks back, they had 
a replica of the Wittenberg doors that they oh, yes. Did you see that? No, I didn't get to see it. But, I was just curious. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, actually, in case any of you are interested, we are going to try to take a trip uh, to Germany next summer, in case anybody really wants to go. Uh, it's to call the, foot, the Footsteps of Luther, so it takes you all through his life and the different places he lived and so forth, and all about the Reformation history. So, anyway, um, Today, I thought I would share with you just a few of the main tenets of our Lutheran faith, which really, if Luther were here today, he said, don't call yourselves Lutherans. He didn't want a church named after him. In fact, he wasn't trying to start a new church. Many Catholic people think that Martin Luther was just like today, there's people starting up churches here in Aliso Viejo and Lake Forest and Mission Viejo or around us. <clears throat> there are startup churches, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's absolutely fine. That's what they think of Luther. But Luther was a Catholic monk, but he was reading God's Word, and he started to see all of these things in the, in the Bible that the church wasn't doing right. He'd become a professor. He's actually Dr. Martin Luther. And I always thought Martin Luther King was, we know who he was, yeah. right? He was with him even most of some of our lives. But his name wasn't Mark, Martin Luther King. Did you know he changed it to Martin Luther because of his effect on humanity? So he changed his name. I can't remember what his real name was now, but I know it wasn't Martin Luther. It was something else, King, and he changed it to Martin Luther King out of his kind of love for what Martin Luther did. So if Martin Luther were here today, I, I'm sure he would tell us, don't call the church Lutheran Church of the Cross, call it Christian Church of the Cross, or something like that would be kind of weird, but, it, but Church of the Cross. And we've even thought about changing the name of our church to that. But then there's those that want to retain that Lutheran name because of what it means. So today what I'd like to share with you is what does Lutheran kind of mean? What does it stand for? Okay. So as we look at that, um, his heart was convicted by reading the Word of God. And again, wasn't trying to start a new church. But um, so the way I kind of explain this is that seal that's on your front of your bulletin. We don't normally print our bulletins in color, but this is kind of a special day. 500 years comes down every 500 years. So we thought we could splurge and print in color. But on the cover, you have the same Luther seal. The Luther seal is actually the part in the middle. Those words on the outside were added later on by some artist. Okay. So um, there's, there, the words around it um, are word alone, faith alone, and grace alone. And then you'll notice in the center of the, of the heart is a cross, which means, which it simplifies Christ alone. And so it, we know that we need to have Christ in the center of our lives. Am I correct? Yes. I know Pastor Freddie preaches that. Christ should be the center of our our lives all the time. It's us that gets out of kilter. But when Christ is in our hearts, it keeps us centered. And I might come to that today. <coughs> so keep that in mind. And then there's this rose, this flower that goes on the outside, so that when Christ is centered in our lives, then our lives tend to blossom. They tend to show forth the fruits of the Spirit because of his presence in our lives. So well, that's the seal. It's like a crest. And over in Germany, that's what people did. They had a family crest or family seal. This is Luther's seal. It helps us to kind of understand these tenets of the word of God. So grace alone. So if you look in your bulletin, I do have these lessons that are inside here for today. And uh, I'm going to read them here. So I, I, I've done my sermon five times this week in LA, but would somebody read Revelation 14, 6 to 7? It's got a nice long voice. Who's got a long voice and wants to read it? Just read it right off. Go ahead. Revelation 14, 6 to 7. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel <clears throat> proclaimed to those who live on the earth, every nation, tribe, language, and people. 
He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. We follow what is called the Common Lectionary in the Lutheran Church. This is common to a lot of different Protestant denominations, as well as even Catholics sometimes. The things <clears throat> tend to line up. It takes you through a three-year cycle of kind of hitting on major portions of Scripture over a three-year period of time. We don't always do this. Sometimes we go on a sermon series, and we've been on a sermon series now since September on the tenets of the Lutheran Church, so we kind of strayed away from these readings. But this, these are the readings for today on Reformation Sunday. And so, an eternal gospel, in Revelation 14, 6, 7, John is saying, this isn't a new gospel. He says, it's an eternal gospel. It never changes. This is in Revelation. It wasn't like John had all this revealed to him, but the gospel is the same we know yesterday, today, and as well as tomorrow. So this eternal gospel. And the gospel is always <coughs> the, the, the pointing us to God's grace. We have a lot of law and gospel in the Bible, right? We have the law in the Old Testament. We have the gospel from uh, the word of Christ. Jesus is the gospel. So, uh, it is the eternal gospel, which is the enduring message of deliverance from evil. This is the grace that Paul speaks about throughout the Bible in his readings and in the New Testament. And it's a living reminder for us today that we are saved by God's grace. So, the, the first part of this by grace, you have been saved through faith. We know that. You know that. And so this is very, very central to us in our Lutheran understanding. The next one is faith alone. Righteousness by faith. So who would like to read a longer passage now? The next one uh, there. Uh, Romans 3, 19 to 28. Would somebody like to read that? Okay. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> now we know that whatever the law says, says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced in the whole world, tell the time to hold you back. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's law by the works of the law. Rather, through the law we become conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith, in Jesus Christ, to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and the Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood. To be received by faith, to be received by faith, he did, to, he did this to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed before him unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. For then is boasting, it is excluded because of what law? The law that requires works, no, because of the law that it requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Very good. So this scripture, along with other scriptures that say these kinds of things, is where Luther started to understand that we are saved by grace through faith. When Luther was struggling with all this, he would, he would literally beat himself and, uh, because he could not understand how he could make himself good enough to receive God's grace. He felt like he had to do something because I'm going back to that passage of Matthew 4.17 where it got mistranslated by Jerome saying, do penance, okay, do something. You must do something in order to find favor with God. 
And that's what that's what the church thought all the way up into the Reformation. It just become it became harder and harder. And the church needed money, and so they just kept heaping these kinds of things onto the people. These impositions, these church. indulgences. That the Roman church. The Roman Catholic Church at that time. Now, since then, there's been Vatican I and Vatican II, and they have come a long ways towards actually accepting a lot of the 95 theses that was part of Luther's debate. They won't still go all the way. They're still uh, struggling. There's still a thought of purgatory. And there is no such thing as purgatory in the Bible. It was something that was, was thought up and made up, again, because of these things that crept in. By the way, there is no perfect church, is there? Because we're all sinners. And so we're not perfect. And so this struggle back and forth, Luther could not figure it out. When he did, it was extremely freeing. And that's what we're going to hear next. As he delved into God's word, then it goes to the gospel reading for the day. I'll read that for us because it's short. Okay? <laughs> All right. John 8, 31 to 36. For the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and we have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we will shall be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. You see, up to the Reformation, it was like that was not understood or can't be understood. And so this is why we believe Martin Luther really, God used him to help rebuild the church. Of course, we know what happened? Well, after he put the 95 Theses on the door of the Wittenberg Church, um, he got excommunicated out of the church. They weren't going to listen to him, at least at that time. And so he got excommunicated, and then those that believed in what Lutherans, or Luther believed, started calling themselves one Lutheran, and not going to be a Catholic Roman Catholic. You see, Catholic means universal church, so a small c in Catholic means just the whole church. But Holy Roman Catholic Church would have been a, a, a certain kind. Okay, so that takes us to, we just have faith alone from our Romans text. Uh, righteousness which comes by faith. So we told that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Luther's understandings were also found in throughout Scripture, where we are saved by grace through faith. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, he reminds us, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works that no one can boast. Scripture of I just read in our gospel today. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. And this truth of God's word is what sets us free. Even our faith comes by hearing, and hearing was the word of Christ. And I'm so, so happy with your church, knowing that Pastor Freddie and others that teach are always bringing you right to the scriptures. That's where we need to be. So in other words, you're sort of a Lutheran church in a way, because you're doing exactly what Luther wanted us to do. Finally, scripture alone from our gospel reading today, the foundations for the 95 Theses came from scripture. John 3.31, if you abide in my word, you will truly make my disciples, and the truth will set you free. The truth of scripture always points us to Jesus Christ as the Savior, 
John 14, 1 through 6, I'm always reading that. I do a lot of memorials and funerals at our church because we're here in Laguna Woods, and our church has a lot of elderly. I must read that at almost every other, other um, memorial service because that's what people want. And that's where Jesus says, trust in me. You've been trusting God, but trust in me. I'm going to go away and prepare a place for you, and I'm going to come back to take you to be where I am. You know the way, the place where I'm going. And then Thomas, you know, he doubts. He says, I don't know where you're going. So how can I know the way? And then Jesus says, and you know it, say it with me. I am the way, life, and truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Okay? This exclusiveness of the gospel is from Jesus himself. And so, uh, there you have it. That brings you to Scripture alone, and then points us to Jesus, who is the Creator, the Redeemer, the Sanctifier. And Luther said, the Bible is the cradle wherein Christ is laid. Because of all the Old Testament Scriptures prophesy that the Messiah is coming. So it points to Jesus. The New Testament, of course, is about Jesus, the Savior of the world. So the whole Bible is the cradle of Jesus. And then, um, as Christ alone, following the Good Shepherd, um, Luther wrote in the small column articles, Luther did a lot of writing, I think you might know. There's a volumes that are about as big as I can stretch my hand of writings. Because the printing press, the Gutenberg printing press was coming about at that time. And so all of a sudden, things could be printed and get gotten out to the people. Luther was the first one to translate the Bible from the Greek and Hebrew, not that Latin Vulgate, nothing necessarily wrong with it, but it has some mistakes in there. But he translated from the original languages of Greek and Hebrew into German. Because the people at that time, they weren't, they didn't understand Latin, and that's what the mass was all done in Latin, in fact, up, up to that many years ago. People didn't understand it. They had to explain what the Latin meant, so they even know what's going on. And so Luther said the people need to understand, they need to, they need to be in God's Word. And so he, in his life, translated the Bible into German. Of course, now, my goodness, I don't know how many different translations there are, but uh, there's a lot of them out there. I don't even know what you use. I often use NIV, NRSV. There's uh, New Jerusalem Bibles. There's, I don't know, what's Pastor Freddy like to use? <laughs> New King James. Okay. So there's just all of these different translations. When I was going to seminary, um, it was, we had computers at the time, but we didn't have like the internet thing going on like we have today. Now you can go there to Bible Gateway and you can see all the translations right together. They just have to go get out a new King James Bible and you know the NIV, the NRC, and lay them out, open them up, find the passages in every Bible, look at them, and then write them down to just compare those. And then do the same thing with the actual Greek, which we you know learned in seminar. And it was a lot of work. So Bible study today is even greater and faster for you than it was for me when I was a seminar. And you can do the same kind of thing. You can look on a word, you can look at it in the Greek, you can see what it means in the Greek, you can see all the different ways it's used throughout the Bible. It's a really wonderful thing. Yes? Thanks to Luther. Thanks to Luther. Yeah, because I don't, uh, if that hadn't happened, maybe another reformer would have come along pretty soon after that, I don't know. You know, there was a lot of re reforming that was going on. Zwingli, Calvin, all those kind of came about. And uh, they all had their different bets on things. But, um, you know, without that, that kind of catalyst of getting it started, it, we would still be just in uh, one church, Roman Catholic church. Okay? So, uh, there you go. You have faith, uh, faith alone, grace alone, scripture alone. And then finally, Christ alone. With solas, uh, the, we call them the four solas, the only okay? solos. So there you have it. And so um, 
I have another video that does have, you have, can you do the microphone thing to it again? These are the pastors now. I twisted their arm. One size fits all. This little costume I got down here at Costume Castle. It wasn't a Luther costume. It was a monk or something. And so uh, uh, this is the other pastors. We had this sermon series. So these are the nuggets of the, of the Lutheran Reformation. And these are, you're going to hear them in just a minute, the second part of my outline here in the board. So it's going to be great, great scripture. Christ, only going to hear that again. Two kingdoms, the message of the cross, and then uh, saint and sinner. I did that one. Law and gospel and eternity. Grace is greater, and living Lutheran in worship. And so we, I'm not going to have time today to look up all those, but you can take the bulletin if you want and take it home, and you can you could look up these scriptures that go along and support that. And again, I'm just sort of scratching the surface of all the teachings and the, the Lutheran Reformation that happened. So here we go. Let's keep going. Okay. Living Lutheran. Well, living Lutheran means grace alone, faith alone, scripture alone, and all under Christ alone. All separate, yet together it is indeed quite the paradox. And yet we trust scripture. For it's scripture that brings us Jesus. You know, Isaiah said that the Lord told him, My ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And it's certainly true for us today. We trust scripture. Not what we think it should say, or what we want it to say, but what God says to each of us. In fact, my conscience and your conscience is captive to the word of God. And as a wonderful German monk said about 500 years ago, this is most certainly true. Living Lutheran means understanding that we live in two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom on earth. Now we were created for the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is perfect and God hardwired us so that we could live perfectly with him in heaven. The kingdom on earth is not perfect and yet we are called to live here as faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. God gives us the discernment to live on earth as if we were living in heaven. This is most certainly true. Living Lutheran means we have a theology of the cross, not a theology of glory. Jesus meets us right where we are, in the midst of our sin, in the midst of our brokenness. He meets us in Holy Communion. He meets us in baptism and gives us His grace, His mercy, His forgiveness. Even when we are at our weakest point, the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. This is most certainly true. <laughs> Living Lutheran means that we live in that struggle between what it means to live as a saint and a sinner. Not saint or sinner. You see, Paul struggled with sin. In Romans chapter 7, he says, For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who shows us mercy and grace. Even in those times when we fail, when we fall short, we have Jesus Christ who has paid the price for our sins. As a chosen child of God, we live as new creations in Jesus Christ every day. This is most certainly true. <laughs> Living Lutheran means understanding how to distinguish between law and gospel. In the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, God's people obeyed Him and they were blessed. They fulfilled the law. Under the New Covenant, Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the law and the forgiveness of all of our sin. He does the work. We don't have to do anything except receive this glorious gift. The law is a command, but gospel and grace is a gift. This is most certainly true. Living Lutheran means God's grace is greater. The Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. <clears throat> And we need to remember, as the writer of Hebrews said, see to it that no one misses the grace of God. God's grace.
grace is greater than your sin. God's grace is greater than your shame, than your failures, than your regrets. God's grace is greater. This is most certainly true. Living Lutheran, what does it mean? Well, it means that God is right here, right now with us. It means that God has gathered us all together so we can believe. Living Lutheran is living confident in Christ's work for us. Living Lutheran is living carefree and comforted in all those wonderful promises that God gives to us. And living Lutheran, well, it's living certain. Certain that God is with us, not just 2,000 years ago, but he's with us right here, right now. He's with us here in our minds. He's with us here in our hearts. He's with us when we gather around word and sacrament. He's with us in our hands. And he's with us in our mouths. You know, all these silly costumes aside, when you get right down to it, living Lutheran is living and knowing that God is for us. For us right now and for us forever. And folks, this is most certainly true. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <laughs> All right, so there you get it. That's just an overview, synopsis of, I don't know, weeks of, we had a sermon on each one of those little segments. That was more scripture, more situations and details around what that means for us today. Again, I cannot reiterate this enough, but I don't believe that if, if Luther could come here and talk to us today himself, I think he'd say, don't call yourselves Lutherans, call yourselves Christians. They're Christ, they're Christ, Christ followers first. And Lutheran is just a flavor of Christians about what we believe and what we put our faith in. And so um, things really haven't changed much over really the 500 years since the Reformation for us as Lutherans. Nothing different or new has come along. There are very many different kinds of levels of Lutheran churches out there. Uh, there's Missouri Synod Lutheran Church, there's a Wisconsin Synod Lutheran Church, and, they, so, and there's a um, Association of Free Lutheran Congregations. We used to be ELCA, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Uh, it became too liberal for us, so we have, you know, it's a whole gamut within this church. We have very, very, very conservative that Wisconsin Synod, I don't know if any of you know anybody to Wisconsin Synod, but uh, Dave, are, are you Wisconsin Synod? Uh, I grew up right next to the Lutheran Church in Wisconsin. Okay, so you know about it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know how it is today, but I know certain Wisconsin Lutherans that will say, oh, I can't, I can't pray with you. They, they couldn't come down here and do a service with a different church because that would be out of bounds or something. I, I don't know. But they won't even pray with other Christians because they're like that. Uh, the frozen Chosen, I think they call it. <laughs> but then, then, then you have everything from the ELC that's become so liberal that almost anything goes. And so we were that, and we couldn't go that far. So we, we just said, you know what, we, we've got to come out of that. So in 2008 and 2009, uh, we, we voted as a church to leave the ELC. So now we're part of Lutheran. Congregations and Mission for Christ, LCMC. It's actually ELC churches that want to stay more true to Scripture and want to stay, you know, fundamentally in God's Word. And so that's where we're at. And that's the same as your parents' church is. And so um, today, um, I, I, I suppose it wouldn't be a good idea for me to go across the street and nail the 95 feet <laughs> of Catholic Church because their, their doors are glass. <laughs> it would not work. I could take them up or duct tape or something, but no. Um, that, that's, that's not going to probably do anything to change them, and it might even drive us farther apart. However, I think 
that if Luther was here today, he'd want to break down those walls. When you think about it, you know, they worship, well, they always are about works. Well, works have their place too. Martin Luther wanted to throw out the book of James because he thought it accentuated works too much. James said, faith without works is what? Dead. And so works has its place. However, I did find a Luther quote um, that I thought was really good. Um, Luther said, God does not need your good works, but your neighbor does. Oh, yeah. Now, isn't that good? Because I think what we need to do today is come together as brothers and sisters in Christ Amen. across denominational lines and whatever. Uh, and we, we all believe in the, as long as we all believe in the core things, which is we are saved by God's grace. We're saved by Jesus Christ and there's not another way to heaven, right? If we believe on some of these basic things, we should just accentuate that to the hill and do things together. So, uh, just a few years ago, all of our churches around here were turning 50 years old because we were given this property by Cortesi, who started looking which was Leisure World to begin with. Remember what it was called that? Uh, yeah. This whole area, this retirement area, was Leisure World. It's now Laguna Woods Village, you had to do a name change. But, um, uh, so all these churches were turning 50 years old, and so, uh, the organist across the street, his name's Emmett Loera, he said, well, let's have a big choir thing, you know, for to celebrate where all of our church choirs and bring it together. Well, that was just a little kind of a catalyst that helped kind of get us together. For years, when I first came here 20 years ago, we used to try to get together with different pastors. The Catholic priests never came, so we never really met with them. And the other churches and the pastors would leave and a new one came along and then just they never got excited about it. Nobody was interested in it. For many years we have not been getting together at all. No, nothing. And so all of a sudden that sort of broke the ice and said, well, if we can sing together, then maybe we could do something else together. We have a homeless <coughs> population around us that some of them sleep right here outside and and it's you know, we're trying to help them. And so, between our different churches, we've kind of come up with some, you know, ways to do that that are better than what we've had in the past. And to do something more significant, a hand up rather than a hand out, mm -hmm. which is so much easier to do, and then just run along. But no, actually helping them. We partnered with Our Father's Table. You guys could partner with them too. In fact, that's where I'm going tonight for supper because we're, doing fundraising things and getting more to do. Gina Cereal has gotten 128 people off the streets in this part of Orange County alone. And this, the <coughs> county of Orange, they're lucky if they get five or six or 10 people off the streets in a year. And the statistics are so, but she cares. She's, it's not a handout, it's I'm gonna help you get redirected and want to walk alongside of you and do things. So anyway, that's a whole other thing. But um, in this part of the county, you would think it's pretty affluent, right? But people are living in Laguna Woods that are barely eating because they don't have enough food to eat because the price to live here has gone up and up and up incrementally, but they're, they've been frozen at their income because they're retired and so they're they're fearfully every day that the water's going to turn off, the is going to get turned off, and they're getting all these bills. And so uh, we decided, oh, there's a food program out there for seniors, but it's not being divvied out here in this area because they wouldn't think anybody needed it. So we got together and we started doing that. Now the Catholic Church people are coming across the street here and helping us with it. You are welcome to help us with it. It's once a month we hand out these food boxes that are about 30 pounds or more of food that are kind of designed to help somebody survive. I mean, a single person through that time. And um, so we're, we're working together, we're rubbing elbows, we're starting to get to know one another across the street at the Catholic Church of all places. And the Methodist Church on the corner. We, we would, uh, it's the second 
Tuesday. I know it's on a Tuesday. We'll check later. We'll check with you later. But if anybody wants to and has time, I know a lot of your congregation of working people, and as you can't do it during the daytime, we have a lot of retired people that are still able to do those things. So, but wouldn't it be great? I think Luther would say, work together, be that universal church that he called us to be. God calls us to be. He doesn't say, no, you shouldn't be that. You should be this and that. He wants us to all be brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I pray that that's something that God will do uh, through us and that there will be continual reformation. We are reformed and we're constantly being reformed over and over again. How? Through God's word. This is where it begins for us as Lutherans and through the Holy Spirit with God's word. Faith that comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. This is why Lutherans tend to start preschools and Lutheran schools. We have a Christian school in the of Gayho. We help start Green Lutheran High School, if you've heard of that out here. Um, Pastor Bill, my predecessor, helped get that started. So when he left here, that's what he took on. Keep him in your prayers. He has cancer. Uh, he was in church this morning, but he's just looking a little weaker every time I see him. And he's just, it's this battle of cancer is becoming really, really hard on him. And so uh, if you could keep him in your prayers. So with that, to conclude today, I brought a prop. Does anybody know what this thing is that's been sitting up here today? Anybody know what this is? Any guesses? Wine cooler? What's that? <laughs> a wine, a wine barrel? Is that a camera? Is that a wine? You love it. Oh, it's a hub. Yeah. It's, a, it's a inside of a wagon wheel. It's a hub. It's a hub. It's a what? It's a wagon wheel. Well, well, back on our farm. Yeah. Big farm uh, wagons. Okay, they were pulled by horses. <laughs> this, is, this is the wagon wheel, okay? And it's, if you want to look at it afterwards, it's really, it's like one piece of wood that's been put together. Most of the others are not. They're pieces of wood laminated or something put together. And then, of course, these holes are what? What wood is that? The spokes. Right. It's like on a bicycle or anything. It's the spokes that come out. Of course, the spokes rotted away quick quickly and they got broken out. And of course back in Iowa they make these into chandeliers. They hang them from the ceiling and put a light bulb inside of it. And the light shines out through the holes. And so today, because the Reformation really is pointing us to Christ, I put a candle in here. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. So um, I use this illustration for kids. I use it for our preschool kids, our Christian school kids, for our seniors, and it's for you today. Yeah, you can turn the lights up and you see any better. And so I, I think of this hub as really it's, it's our life. Our life is like this hub of this wheel. And these spokes are maybe different areas in our life. This is, you know, this is your life with your family. This might be the life of your extended family. This one might be at your workplace. This might be here today at church. It might be, you know, in your sphere of influence. If you travel, or do things in your life. These are just the activities and things of your life. Those different holes and those spokes. If if one of those spokes gets out of kilter, and all we do is we focus on work. Or we focus on sports or something else in our life, then that wheel is going to be out of balance. But when Christ is in the center of our lives, it's like this candle in the middle here, and the light is coming out in all directions. I've got it over here and over here, all the way around. You can just turn this thing around, and you see the light of Christ. Shining. Turn it. Okay. Turn it. Yeah. We can see it better if you turn it. Okay. So again, Luther's seal, remember the heart, the cross in the middle, 
That's the central, right? Right at the center of our hearts. A little song I sing, into my heart, into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, come in to day, come in to stay, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Did you sing that? Anybody else? <laughs> okay. I grew up with these little Sunday school songs all the time. Uh, tomorrow night, I will be, we have the um, Bethesda Homes, it used to be called Good Shepherd Homes. There are all these group homes in the Good Hills and Mission Viejo that have uh, people with Down Syndrome, and they, they are taken care of beautifully in these homes. And so they come to our church every Tuesday night, and they have supper, and then we have a little program. We have a... Uh, like a devotion, a little story, very simple so they can understand it. We, we do a craft, and so a lady in our church says she puts a craft together for all of them, 75 of them. And then each house, there's 11 houses, so that's, there's six in each house, that's 66 plus two caregivers, so that fills up our, our social home upstairs. Valerie that cooks, she cooks the meal every Tuesday night when they get this nice meal and then they sing songs. And we sing, this is a light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. You know those are the Sunday school songs? And they want to sing every week, you know. They want to sing, Jesus loves me. Because they're just, that's where they're, they're at. And they're, and they're, and they're they glow, they shine. And I think, again, if Martin Luther were here, he'd say, don't call yourselves Lutherans, call yourselves Christians. If Jesus were here, he'd say, keep on being a church. The mission of the church is to reach others for Christ. I would invite you to pray for me and my wife, Marcia, and Becca Bay, our children's ministry director, and two others from our church, because very recently, um, we... We just got the word to go to Uganda, and we're going to go there. We've been invited by two different missionaries, and now a third one. And we weren't planning to go till next summer, but um, one of the missionaries, Denise Carlson, said, we need you now. We, you know, there's just so much need. In northern Uganda, southern Su South Sudan, the people are coming across the border so much, so fast, that the United Nations said it's the largest refugee camp in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. It's a, it, definitely in the UN, but they just figure it's just so many people exiting. These people are living in white uh, canvas kind of tents from the UN, and um, the pastors that left Sudan, the ones who are Christian, they didn't even allow them to bring their Bibles with them. It's what the clothes they had on their back, and they force them out of the country. And so our church was very generous towards that. And one Sunday we got in like close to $5,000 just for that. And so they, the missionary there can buy cases of Bibles and they're passing them up in these camps. So anyway, I'm going to be preaching two weeks from today in a tent in a Lutheran church in a refugee camp in northern Uganda. And I still can't get my head wrapped around that. <laughs> so I don't know what I'm going to do or say, but uh, then they want me to speak to all the pastors. And there's like 75 pastors in this one area where she works. But so she's lining up some sort of pastor's conference, and I'm a keynote speaker. I've never done anything like that before in my life. So just pray for the Holy Spirit to reveal to me what it is I'm supposed to say in a limited amount of time, whatever that is. So we're going to be gone from November the 9th to the 28th. And so we're going to go to that place and we're going to go to Bali uh, where they have faith radio. We support a uh, missionary there. And then this Ugandan children's choir that came through here, they slept in this room, by the way. Uh, a couple times, and uh, they just love the Lord, and they are just on fire for Jesus. And uh, this this orphanage was started by Reverend Moses. Isn't that a great name? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Reverend Moses had five or six kids. He brought. He saw that they were being abused, 
and they were living in the streets. They took them into their home. They started to provide for them, and pretty soon they took in more people. How many of you saw that movie, Queen of Kachula? I can't say it, but it's the, the girl that is the chess player. Chess player. Okay. She's from that village, and she's from that orphanage. And so the, the guys that were here in that choir said they all know her. And she said, you know, she's, she's made a big way in the world. Okay. Yeah. So I'm sorry, I think I went on longer than I was supposed to today. So, sorry. Yeah. Well, English is the national language of Uganda, but they don't all speak it. So there's going to be translators for Swahili and some other uh, African language. There's several African languages. So. Well, all I can say is after today, all of this I have told you, I can tell you for sure, it is most certainly true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Luther, Luther said this thing, so when he was being on trial, they actually put him on trial to get him to recant about this. So they put him on trial in front of all these kind of bishops and the hierarchy of the people in the Catholic Church, almost like begging him to recant of these words. He said, I cannot. My conscience is only uh, subject to the word of God, and here I stand. So that's good. That's a, a stalwart stake in the ground of the Ben Maui and the Revolution. Is Yeah. <laughs> Can we pray? Yeah. Yeah. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day of Reformation and in our Lutheran Church. We thank you for the Church of Hope. We thank you for uh, their love for your work from the many Lutherans down in the basement. <laughs> we thank you for their love for you and for uh, sharing the gospel. I pray you bless them, bless all their mission work that they are doing. And uh, their event last night, we uh, just pray that that yield is a hundredfold. I thank you for each member of this church and I pray that you would bless them, and this church would continue to flourish and grow, and someday have to uh, move into a bigger space in this uh, youth room downstairs here. And we pray that you would uh, just continue to light a fire under all of us, that we would make a difference in our own families, first of all, then to our neighbors, then to our co-workers, then to all those in our neighborhoods and around us and our workplaces and then to the ends of the earth. Even places like Uganda, places where uh, life is very challenging and hard. So we pray, Lord, that uh, you would use us as a priesthood of all believers. And I just thank you for this day and we ask your, your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.